Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Hard Nine Podcast. Today, uh, as we stand right now, May 20, Tuesday, May 23rd, 2023, uh, Cardinals are 7-3 and three in their last 10, have won four series in a row, and somehow, by the grace of all things baseball gods, find themselves only five games out in the NL Central. Yeah, um, being in the worst division in baseball definitely helps because, oh, well, maybe second yeah. worst, that, that yeah. AL Central's garbage but the NL Central um yeah and Ken Rosenthal had a take that I just saw on Twitter he had a video he's on that foul territory podcast now um with AJ Przinsky and Mm -hmm. Scott Brown I recommend listening to that even though they shit on the Cardinals all the time but whatever um he he said he thinks the Cardinals are going to win the division by 10 games that's what Ken (laughs) Rosenthal said he thinks and I honestly I I could see I mean here's the thing like the Brewers the Brewers have really bad luck right now with injuries which you know, it's going to happen when you build a team solely, you know, with your pitching. That's why I just don't think that's a good way to build your team is with pitching. Because Placed another guy on the IL today, Eric Lauer. Yeah, and Ashby's on there, Brandon Woodruff's on there. Um, obviously, don't wish for that to happen, but that's the reality of it right now. And the Cardinals, man, they're just playing good baseball right now. Like, they lost yesterday. You know, I'm I'm going to give them a pass. I won't say mulligan, but I'll <laughs> give them a free pass um, because, you know, you're going to lose games – like that, where you're the, you know, you, you got yourself an opportunity where one of Goldie Contreras, Nolan or Gorm, or one of the Nolans, I guess, if one of those guys came through in that last inning, you win the game. They didn't. I'll bet on those guys nine out of 10 times for one of those, them to come through in that spot. They just didn't. And that's going to happen sometimes. But what they did over the weekend in, against LA was, I want to say the most impressive series against LA we've seen in years, like at least five years, where they've sure actually like it. won three or four from LA. Like, I don't remember anything like that happening in recent memory. And man, there's just a different feel to the team right now. A lot of guys, you know, you, if you would have told me our outfield would be, you know, Donovan left, Mercado in center, and Tommy in right on any given day, you know, if Newt had a day off, I would have been like, what the hell happened to this team? But they're, they've all stepped up, and it's just working. Like, guys, guys are – I'm really impressed with the flexibility of this roster. But more than that, the Donovans and Edmonds being able to go out, play a different position – play it well and still produce offensively. I think we take that for granted that you're going to move a guy from second to right field and his offensive numbers are just going to trans transfer. That's not always the case. So that's why those two guys are so extremely valuable to what this team is doing right now. And I want to give them some love off the top because I think they deserve it. Yeah. Well, and then added to it, I think it's, we have to give some massive love to Oscar Mercado. Like, like, I mean, a guy that I think a lot of us thought might just be a DFA guy. Like we bring him, they bring him in for spring training, maybe add some more depth to a place that's already incredibly deep. Um, you, then you worry about, okay, well, there's a log jam at, at the beginning of the year in the outfield at the big league camp. Then maybe there's a log jam when Walker gets sent down at the triple A. Is Oscar Mercado going to be the, you know, unfortunately the sacrificial lamb, the blood sacrifice to go back to succession there and get him, get him out? No, he comes up. And isn't just, you know, he's going to play good defense every day. That's been his MO. Uh, He had a nice, really good offensive run for a little bit in Cleveland. But what he's done here, again, very small sample size, but has been electric. And, you know, we we talk on here a lot about the chicken and the egg, right? Is it is winning? Are you winning because you're having fun? Is it fun because you're winning? Well, we've talked also how losing is contagious. We saw it for the first 40 games, 35 games of the season. But so is winning. And when you see the energy that we've seen guys, especially in that homestand, that Wilson brings to the to not just the lineup, but to the dugout, to the base paths, to with the umpire and getting him Max Muncy's head. Then you saw, I mean, we've talked about on here, one of our favorite players, and we have said this since he's gotten called up, actually since before that when he was still Triple A, has been Nolan Gorman. And he's always been just like that guy. Like, I just go about my business. But to see him with the bat, not just the flip, which he did the other night, but then the toss into the ground after he hits the lefty off of a lefty, which was sort of a fuck you at everybody for maybe not letting him play against lefties. I mean, when you start to see that, you're you're seeing guys play with a little different swagger now. And again, chicken and egg. Is it because you're winning or whatever? Doesn't matter. I don't care. Let's just keep the train running because we know that if you were to look at every team on paper in the NL Central, the Cardinals have the best roster and it's honestly probably not even close it's not close it's not even close to being close but um Wilson Contreras started this I think is what I, he started the attitude Do you remember we were they were going through that slump and then they won that game in 
against Detroit where Donovan hit the homer. But then they went on to Chicago and he started doing the the little hand thing towards mm-hmm. the fans. And then that gave him a little bit of swagger. And I think we talked about that when we got Wilson was he's he's not just going to bring like an 800 OPS as a catcher, which which he probably will by the end of the year. But he's also going to bring an energy this team hasn't had I, I, in years. I know Yadi brought some of that. That's a different kind. Yadi was more like if you if you poke the bear, he's going to come at you. Wilson's more he, he'll poke you like he'll poke you and see how you react. And then, you know, like we saw with Mad Bum when Mad Bum, you know, started yelling at him. We saw with Max Muncy, who got ejected because he was frustrated <laughs> that Wilson was stealing strikes behind the plate. Like we've he's more of the guy that's going to instigate. Yachty was kind of the guy that would retaliate. And I think it's refreshing to see that because, I mean, there's a lot of guys on the successful teams that, that do that, that instigate and get in people's heads. And it's it's not just basketball that it happens, and it happens in baseball. Acuna does it sometimes. Like it's And it's really refreshing to see. And also, I think the team is, finds it refreshing. Like, I think, I think they're enjoying having that on their side because if Nolan or Goldie did that and it would feel manufactured and fake, players can sniff that out when you're, when you're faking it. Like that's just who Wilson is. He's just that guy, like his home run celebrations on what was that? That Thursday first game of the Dodgers series. I have never seen a Cardinal player act like that after hitting a home run, a three run home run in my life. And it was awesome to see. And it, it brings energy to the stadium like that. He might be top five, most loved player on that team right now by the fan base. It seems like. Yeah. It seemed like, for, for a franchise tried to turn him into a goat and it really turned him or a heel and it really turned him into uh like beloved and maybe hey, a rally and cry right a big t- hit. yeah don't say rally squirrel but yeah we're we're good with with I moving didn't say on squirrel. Uh, speaking of acuna I didn't say that squirrel. guy just took i know you didn't i'm glad i was worried i got nervous for a second um acuna took third on a walk at, when he was on first base last night or two nights ago was that max muncie on third too right i think Contreras got in max muncie's head uh, I think that's the problem. Like that, Max, Max might be in trouble right now because of Wilson Contreras, but it, it's a little bit of everybody who's contributing. I mean, like I said, Mercado, look, we would be remiss to not say, to not give you the kudos before you give yourself the kudos. Maybe I uh, don't want you to hurt a shoulder or an elbow reaching around to hit yourself on the back. But you did say in that first Dodgers game that Wilson was going to have a big home run. Uh, they did end up blowing them out, but he also had two home runs. So maybe you weren't, you didn't go far enough with your prediction. They weren't blowing him but, out when he hit the home run. No, I know. I understand. I'm just saying, but he did hit two. Also, seven home runs with Urias on the bump. Obviously, not all of those off of him. Most of them, though, uh, first time since 1940, May 7, 1940 at Sportsman's Park. That's wild. That's a wild stat. So, that was pretty incredible to see. Yeah, I mean, that was – and obviously, Urias goes on the injured list after that. So, I'm sure some people are going to say, well, he only gave up those homers because he was hurt. I'm going to say I he's only care. hurt because he gave up the homers, but we'll see. Because um, <laughs> he's been horrible his last three starts. So, there might be a little bit of manipulation going on there. But I want to get into Gorman because I think he had, he obviously player of the week. So, congrats, Gorman. That's his first ever. Uh, and a player of the week, first of many, hopefully. Um, but – to have a week where he, where Ollie said, we're going to give him more chances against lefties, which awesome. Should have done that probably a month ago. And for him to come up in that series where they're playing him against lefties and to hit a homer off of Urias, one of the better left-handed pitchers in all of baseball, and then to hit a three-run bomb to give him the lead um, in the eighth inning against, what was that, Victor Gonzalez, I believe, another mm-hmm. lefty. And, it, like, he's doing everything right now. And maybe he's going to end up being a guy that, is okay league average against lefties. And this is just because he's red hot right now. But at the end of the day, like he's their best player right now. And it's not even close. Like it's not even close. Yeah. Like I said, we have been like pumping his praises for, for a year and a half now. Probably. But even then I didn't think and, he was going to do this. Well, just to add to, and I think one thing that nobody seems to be talking about, understandably so probably is the fact when you put him at third base, He's not a liability. He's playing very well there, but he has made some incredible plays at second base. I think you were talking about his outs above average when we were talking about this the other day uh, at second base. Like he is, he's not a defensive liability. Like a lot of people tried to say he was going to be guys. I, I think, I don't know that a lot of people realize how difficult of a move it is when you've played third base your entire life to move to second base. Like a lot of shortstops talk about the difficulty from just moving from short to second because of the pivot, because of the blind turn, just because of the angle of the ball coming off of a right-hander's bat or the power coming off of a left-hander's bat. It is a different, it is a different 
position to play. And you're talking about a guy who was not a middle infielder, but who has made himself into not just an average second baseman, but right now he looks to be above average at everything he's doing when it comes to the game of baseball. Yeah. And he's, he's leading the NL in slugging right now by the 636 yes. slugging percentage. Next closest is Acuna at 598. So that's a 38 point difference. And the, um, and the first and second place. So he's like leading by a mile. Like he could go a week without doing very well and probably still be up there. Um, Aaron judge leads the league at a 642. So he's, he's six points behind Aaron judge for the league lead. And after him, it's like Jordan Alvarez, who's 20 points away. So he's, he's among the best and he's kind of smoking some of the best in terms of bad um, slugging. And it's just, it's so impressive to see. Like, it seems like he gets extra base hit every game. Like even yesterday, in a game where he was, didn't look amazing, he walked and then hit a double off a lefty, off another lefty. Yeah. Like, I didn't I didn't and, see this development of him crushing left-handed pitching coming. I mean, I think we hoped it, right? We hoped it. And, you know, but you're right. We didn't see it. And also, to be fair, you said it. Even if he is just league average against lefties, like at the bare minimum, league average, what he does against righties makes him way more than any sort of weapon that most teams will have. Now we talked about the last seven games they did give, I thought smartly gave him the night off against Kershaw. Like that, that you're going to have to probably pick and choose like what lefties do you want to use him against? And I have no, no problem with that, with the depth that this team has, especially right now in the middle infield. But if you want to talk about just in his last week, right? The Brewers, Dodgers, obviously one game with the Reds right now. He has an OPS of 1.355. He's hitting 400 with three home runs and six RBIs. Like that's just in a week, right? That's why he was player of the week. Um, unfortunately, Paul DeYoung, like who we want to, I think we have to now transition over to that. I mean, what, how about the Paul E.D. revenge tour? I, I, here's what I'm going to say. I, I'm going to preface this. I'm going to let you take it away. Uh, there's a few things I know I want to say about Paul e. We have been very critical of Paul DeYoung on here. Uh, his performance, not Paul DeYoung as a human, not Paul DeYoung as a person, not anything else, because for two and a half years, you couldn't watch what he was doing and not be. Uh, what was the word I'm looking for? Yeah, exact frustrated. Right. You couldn't be, you know, the contract, the, the expectations, giving him 60 game leash last year. I mean, we've all talked about how maybe Paul DeYoung needs a change of scenery, whatever he's done. All right. And, and we everybody, whatever he's done, it is working. And I am so freaking pumped for that guy. Because of it, because you got to know, like, none of us know what I can't imagine what he thought every night as he laid in bed, like at being so good at something your entire life and then not being able to find it anymore. And now to get it back. And though I will say this, and it's the last thing I'm saying, because we're not going to be negative. The one thing that drives me crazy, and I'll never, ever understand it, is the amount of people who seem to seemingly want Paul DeYoung to either fall on his face or fail again. So that in their minds, they can be justified in saying that the Cardinals should not be play, playing him and that he's not good at the game of baseball. I'll never understand that. I'm incredibly pumped for him. What he did the last two and a half years is completely irrelevant to what he's doing right now. It's also complete right now is completely irrelevant to what he'll do the rest of the season or anything else. Enjoy this. This is a great reclamation story of a guy who's never done anything bad. Like he does not have a past of being a bad human. Like let's be happy for him. Also, there's also he has been a major part in this winning streak for the Cardinals. Enjoy it, folks. Enjoy it and hope it continues. Yeah, and actually, like he's one of the better Cardinals from everyone. Everyone's always said Paul Young is a great human. So if you want to root for somebody just as who they are as a person. And also, I met Paul Young a few times. Very nice to me. So I can vouch for him as a nice human. Um, he yeah, it's really impressive. He's been the best shortstop in the National League since he's been up. And it's not even close like his. His season long stats are up there with any with any um, shortstop in the National League, but especially since he's been up in those twenty four games, like he's gonna if he has another you know month where he's you know at eight hundred ish OPS, he's gonna be pushing for an All Star spot. Like that's how good he's been, and you know eight home runs in twenty four games, like that's a pretty damn good pace. And he he's slugging six twenty seven, like that's incredible. Like he would be if he was qualified, which. It might be part of the reason why he's slugging 627. I get it. He hasn't had as many at bats as everyone else. But if he was qualified, he'd be right up there with Gorman on uh, top three in the NL. So just to just to add on to what you just said there with him being one of the best shortstops right now, uh, to, to put him against the free agents, just did a little looking 
uh, at this. And shout out to my my, my guy, Johnny Van, Van Bikitas, who sent this to me. Owner of the Ranch House. If you're in Godfrey Alton, go to the Ranch House. Incredible place. My favorite place in the entire world. But he sent me this the other day. Now, you have to take it with a grain of salt because it is a quarter of a season. But when you look at the, the guys, Correa, Bogarts, Swanson, and who am I missing? Trey Turner. Now, Trey Turner, incredible athlete, incredible player. We knew the Cardinals weren't going to sign him because of the money in the contract. Same with Bogarts, right? We, You and I, I, I always want Carlos Correa. I will always want – he's really slumping. We, you and I were both on record saying there's no reason to get Dansby Swanson when you've got Tommy Edmond and you got Mason Wynn on the, on the way. But just to put it into perspective, Turner in 44 games, uh, 390 – and in, in his OP, in his OP, or uh, sorry, slugging 390, four homers, 10 RBIs, 0.4 war. Bogarts in 45 games, a 1.5 war, six homers, 16 RBIs. Correa in 42 games, a 0.3 war with six home runs and 23 RBIs. Swanson in 44, four homers and 18 RBIs with a 2.1 war. Paul DeYoung in 22 games has six homers and 10 RBIs. And that's actually gone up now because this was before the game yeah, yesterday. No, no, he has 24 games and he's hit eight home runs. Yeah, so that's why I said that was before the last. He's games. had two home runs since that. And so what is his days. war now? Do you have that in front 1. of you? One point four. One point. One point four. Yeah. So so basically, half the games. One, he's been better than all of them. But also, since you were someone gave you that stat that said he'd been better than them, he had two home runs in two games. So right, he's right. been even better than when <laughs> that was sent to you. That's how good he's been. And you know, anyone that's rooting against any player on the Cardinals, you're stupid. And I hope you hear that if you're watching this. Yeah, that makes I do no too. sense. Like you're rude. You're a Cardinal fan. Also, Paul DeYoung has done nothing to you. I get he was bad for, um, I know three years. I mean, he was really bad. Like he knows that. We all know it. But one credit to the organization, I guess, for standing by him. Like a lot of people were mad at them, and they kind of took the bullets and said, "We believe he's made a substantial change." We all rolled our eyes because they've said that before. But it looks like he has, and a lot of his peripherals kind of say, "Yeah, he's definitely made a change." That's at least some bit of like sustainable. Is he going to have a 600 slugging? Probably not. But he that doesn't he doesn't have to. Like here's the thing with Paul DeYoung that people don't understand. Well, maybe you do understand. I shouldn't say that. But some people seem to disregard. I guess that's a better a better way to put it. One, he's a damn near Gold Glove caliber shortstop. The guy doesn't make errors ever, and he makes some really really good plays. Um, two, he if he's batting, let's say he gets down to his batting average around 230 240. Um, if, he, if Paul DeYoung is going to bet seventh or eighth for you and play gold glove caliber defense at shortstop while being a mistake hitter that hits 30 bombs, that is a way more valuable eight hitter than any other team in baseball has. Quite a weapon. Quite a like, weapon. That's what I'm saying. So he doesn't have to be, you know, the guy that you maybe hoped he was after 2019 when he was an all star and we're hoping he was going to be 35 homer, you know, what elite shortstop. He doesn't have to be that right now what he needs to be is he needs to be a steady presence at short will stop which he is he needs to hit mistakes and hit him far which he's doing and after that i don't really care like he's clutch too paul young's always come up in big situations even when he was struggling he'd had some big moments so like i i'm really happy for him and i'm glad i gotta wear my jersey again in public but um yeah i hope it continues to some extent like by continues like he's gonna go through a slump where he's might probably bad for two weeks because Nolan Arnott just went through a month of that. So when that happens, I hope they don't, you know, people don't just trash oh, on him, but I know they will. They're going to. They're crashing him now while he's doing well. It's the it's the wildest thing. And honestly, it's impossible to take anybody seriously that way. Like you said, everybody knows his struggles. He knows the struggles. Everyone knows it. Just enjoy what he's doing right this second, right now. We don't know what he's going to do in a week or four weeks or six weeks. Let's hope it continues. Because if it continues, it only means our team, the team that we root for, the team that we have a podcast about is doing well. That's that's all I care about. That's literally all I care about. And, you know, I had questions about I, – I asked multiple times early on, questioning Jordan Hicks, what was going on? Because my thing isn't – with Jordan, again, also wasn't personal. It's I've never seen a guy throw 102 like that with that nasty stuff be so hittable. All of a sudden, Jordan Hicks looks way better. These aren't are, – any questions we have with the players on this team – are not personal and never will be like we are player pro player. That's one thing we always talk about coming on here. We want to see everyone succeed and make billions of dollars. That's what we want. Watching Paul Dion succeed as a big part of what the Cardinals have done in the last 24 games. I mean, it's not a coincidence. It's, it goes hand in hand. He has now forced the hand to where Brendan Donovan's playing in the outfield. Tommy Edmonds playing second and in the outfield. That's good. That's, that's a good thing for this team who continues to play 
uh, not understand that they can have 26 guys that they can play with, but they now have really 24 because they're going with a six man rotation and Trace Barrera is still sitting there as their other guy. It's a, I, I still have a lot of questions about the roster. Before we get into that, because I want to talk more about the young and Gorman actually, because I think it would be e- like the most impressive thing for both of those guys and what they're doing right now is they did it against two of the best pitching staffs in baseball with the Brewers and the Dodgers. Like that, like Paul Deion's not hitting cheap homers off of, you know, the Pirates fifth starter. He hit it off of Corbin Burns, you know, um, Nolan Gorman and Andy went off Urias. Like the Nolan Gorman, I, I tweeted this out winning player of the week in a week where he faced Tony Gonsolin, Julio Urias, Corbin Burns and Freddie Peralta in four of his starts. That's incredibly impressive. Like mm-hmm. that's, It'd be like if he was facing, you know, the Reds and then the Rockies. You know, it's really impressive, but not as impressive as what they're doing against elite pitching. Paul DeYoung hit a two-run bomb off of Corbin freaking Burns. Last year, I'm sorry, I know you might not believe in his swing changes. Maybe some of you don't. Last year, he couldn't do that. Like, there's no No. world in which he would have done that. So, to some extent, the changes are definitely, you know, real. I hate that because it is real. We're seeing it happening. But I think it is sustainable to some extent. It's just cool to see guys step up finally. Like, like we talked about Oscar. This is what you need. Now, people are ask the question: Is it sustainable? Well, who who cares if it's sustainable? Because right. you can say yes right. or no, but none of us know. But all I know is we need to win baseball games now because we dug ourselves a hell of a hole. And they're both all of these guys are helping them win games right now, and that's fun to see. Like maybe maybe when we get to August, Paul DeYoung's not starting anymore, and Tommy's deck at shortstop. Okay, maybe that does happen. But if Paul DeYoung helps us win, you know, 10 games in this in this two-month stretch where he's hot, that's going to help you win a division. So that's all I care about right now. Yeah, it's 162 games. We know there's going to be injuries. Right now, Oscar Mercado's getting a chance because Tyler O'Neill's on the shelf, and we don't know. We just don't – we don't know what's going on with him. It's, it's weird. We can talk about that later at a different date or whatever. Uh, we know that he's doing that also because Dylan Carlson's on the shelf, who was, by the way, having a, a pretty good year so far. Um, but that's what you have to have is those guys who fill in step up. And in the past, we've no offense to the people who the Justin Williams, the Austin Deans, the fill in the blanks who came up and had an opportunity and didn't do that. Honestly, Taylor Motter, like you can you can go on and on. There, there's been a lineage of that. Um, but, yeah, that's the key. The guys who are getting an opportunity stepping up and we've said on here, you, do, you don't need everybody hitting every night. If you do, that's great. But if you get three you have a chance to win every single night because those three on the, in this lineup can carry you. And that's all you need. And, and it, Hey, when it's a different three every night, it's great. If it's, if it's Gorman for six straight, awesome. If it's not okay, somebody will pick him up and, and, and pick up the slack um, before we, before we transfer over uh, as always, we appreciate you guys watching. Uh, you can find us on our Twitter handles. Hopefully Caleb gets it right this week. Um, I am Mike and he is Caleb. Uh, he likes to transpose those for some reason. But you can find us on Twitter. Hit that subscribe button. We are getting very close to the 400 level. We'd like to hit that this week. Next stop, 500. So tell a friend, bring them on, get them going. We've had the last few podcasts have been really, really successful because of y'all. We're glad to have you back. But hit that subscribe button. That helps us out a lot. Let's talk a little bit about the roster because it does still sort of perplex me. And I, And let me say this. Logically, So before somebody comes at me and and tries to explain it to me logically, I understand that if you're going to have Contreras DH at times and Kisner catch, you have the option now to be protected. However, and you've brought this up, I think on air, but if not with me, like if you get to the ninth inning, you can't have, if you have to pinch hit for or Andrew Kisner, you can't have Trace Barrera catching at this point in time. You just can't, it's not a shot at him. Please understand that. He's just not the guy you can have behind there. Last night cost us a base, maybe cost us a run. I'm not saying Wilson blocks it. I'm not saying kids blocks it are are cleanly. I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying that's what happened last night. At at worst, you drop the DH. Like at worst, you drop the DH because when it comes back around to the pitcher spot, you can pinch it anyway. You got guys on the roster. There's a guy somewhere at AAA right now who is better suited to be on this roster to help this team twice a week, maybe more than Trace Barrera. And if we're going to go to a six-man rotation, which we're going to talk about Libertor here in a minute, then now you're now down a reliever every night as well. So the roster, this has been a problem here since, honestly, 
Matheny took over. Roster mismanagement has been a problem for the last 11 years. We've seen it rare to ugly in the playoffs. We've seen it in the regular season. Guys, they give you 26 for a reason. Go ahead and let's give me the best 26 every night. That's all I'm asking. Well, it has nothing to do with Matheny. It's the guy running the roster, which is John Mosellock. So, I mean, that hasn't changed. That's why it's continuing to be a problem. Um, it is, yeah, it's stupid. And I don't have anything against Tres Pereira, but he's not good. No. I just, I'm going to say it. He's not good. He got cut by the Nationals. If he's not good enough to be on the Nationals, he's not good enough to be on the Cardinals, okay? That's where we're at. So I just don't understand why he's good depth in the organization, but, like, there should never be a spot where Tres Pereira's hitting, hitting in extra innings. Like, that's so stupid. If you trust Kisner to catch um, and you when Wilson's DHing, then trust Kisner to take the fuck in the bat. Like, that's where I'm at with it. If you want to bring – if you want – like here's or also like maybe when Kisner's catching to um to relieve Wilson, maybe Wilson doesn't have to DH every time that happens. You know, maybe right. give Wilson an actual day off so the guy doesn't get run into the ground. I don't think he's ever played more than 130 games. He's got on pace to play like 150 right now. He had the guy a few days off, so maybe he can come in and, and take that at bat, you know, and not play the whole nine innings. I just I don't I understand what they're going for, but I just think it's stupid because you don't see this like the the Blue Jays don't carry three catchers when Kirk is for when Kirk is DHing and Jansen is catching. They don't do that. So so we don't need to do that. Like if this is the case, then you know what they should have done. They should have gone out and got a catcher, a backup catcher that you trust to hit at least a little bit. And they didn't do that. So that doesn't mean you should be playing a man down every day. It's just it's no. dumb to me. I I mean it's not something to harp on too much because it really hasn't hurt them. The fact. Since they made that move, heard them last night. Really, maybe. I mean, you can't say they would have won that game without that happening. But that's fair. But but I do like the fact that Ali is managing aggressively to try and win games. Like I like that he brought in Burleson and Donovan. Um, in the bottom of that order for that inning, like the, those were good moves that could have won you the game. Like if if Burleson comes up for Kisner and gaps one, and we win the game by two, no one's talking about Trace Pereira. But when it doesn't work, it looks bad. I I just think it's wasting. 26 spots on a team is not very many and just wasting one of them. Like that's tough, especially it'd be different if you have like a Jansen and a Kirk situation where it's two guys that both mash and they're both very, very good catchers, but no offense to Andrew Kisner. He's not at that level. So you already have one backup catcher that you don't really love necessarily. And now you have two, like it's just, I don't get it. Yep. Um, you brought him up. Any concern about Burley? Uh, with a 660 OPS right now. I mean, it's not like he's, I mean, I know obviously he's a bench player right now. So I guess maybe let's relax on that. Do you, do, are you of the, of the idea that maybe get him down to triple A to let him play every day to maybe get him ready? Because he he's not getting a lot of at bats every week. He's really struggling when he does get at bats. He doesn't give you uh, a defensive replacement late in the game kind of guy. In fact, you're going to probably take him out late in the game if you do start him. Uh, where do we stand? Where, where do you stand on, on the thoughts on that? And my thought is, I'll go back to it. I know that he's not your future at first base, and I get it. Um, but instead of maybe having Trace Barrera, let's go ahead and call a guy like Luke and Baker up, who you don't have to worry about. He's 26. You don't have to worry about him getting every day at bats because you're not trying to develop him to become your new first baseman, probably. Like, I love the guy. I'm just saying, I'm just looking at this from an organizational standpoint. And I know you'd have to get him on the 40-man roster. I understand that as well. However, there is some flexibility there. I mean, maybe that's – at least that's a guy who can come in late in the game and give you an at-bat that could potentially win it for you. Um, is that a thought – like, I, I asked you two questions there. So, so let take me them answer, how you Let want. me answer the question. Let me answer the question. Okay. <laughs> you, asked, you asked me a question and then talked about something completely different. Well, you know how the brain works. It all goes okay, well, leads we'll, into one, we'll and fix, then it has fix. to get stream of consciousness. So we'll fix your brain because that was stupid. I, can't, I don't that, know what to do with that. 49 but, years with this brain but hitting. Alex Burleson is starting against right-handed pitching right now. Like he has been. Um, like he's playing left field again today. No, I don't think he needs to be down there. Like he, he's another guy, like he's 23, 24 years old, right? Like he's not a young prospect. Like, like this is kind of might be who he is. He might end up being a bitch bat that can start for you. Um, 24 years old. I think he turns 25. He turns 25 this year. There's no reason to send Alec Burleson down, in my opinion. He's taking some really good bats off the bench. He's he's a good energy guy in the dugout. He's He actually was a defensive replacement for Juan Yepes because, guys, I just don't want to see that guy. I love Juan. 
but he cannot play outfield. Like it's it's so bad. Just no. put Gorman at second and put Donovan in the outfield if you want to play Juan and have him DH. But no, Burleson, I'm not worried about him at all. Like I think he's hit the ball so hard that I do think he's got a little bit unlucky. I gotta look at his baseball savant page. But now I keep him up. Like it's the same reason you just said for Luke and Maker. Like you're not really trying to develop Alec Burleson to be your everyday outfielder because you know when everyone's healthy, he's not going to be that. I do think they tried to force that at the beginning of the year by batting him second for a long stretch of time. And he did some good things there, but I think he is right now what he is. And it's a really good hitter. Like he is a really good hitter. I think that can give you good at bats. He never really looks overmatched to me. Like he always looks like he has a chance and he, he does a lot of things well. So I'm not worried about him at all. At least, at least not right now. I, I agree with you on that. 100%. Um, he's only got seven at bats in the last seven games. Now he is starting tonight. But again, that's what I, I guess that's sort of my point with a guy like Luke and Baker is instead of Trace Barrera, my, my, I was not saying Baker over um, Alec Burleson, by the way, just to clarify, I'm saying we don't need three catchers. Let's go ahead and get a guy who, if you need, can give you a bat. The argument against it is, well, we have one Yepes. I understand that. Like, I understand why you need them both, but why will I'll, I will just circle it all the way back around the wagons and ask that is fine. But why in the world do we need three catchers? The answer is we don't. Nobody else carries three catchers. You don't need it. And he Trace Burrell got one at bat in the last seven days. They're, they're, you, he's just eating up a roster spot of a guy who potentially, you go into extra innings, who knows, whatever, could give you an elite at bat. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying I'm right. I'm not saying it's wrong. Whatever. I just, in my mind, carry Trace Barrera makes sense. I've said it ever since it happened. It just doesn't make sense to me. Let's Let's transfer over now. Because you've brought this up to me, uh, you only get thirteen bullpen or thirteen arms. All right, uh, thirteen arms. You can't go to fourteen. So the twenty-six, you got to have thirteen at bats, thirteen arms. You could have fourteen bats and twelve arms. You just can't have more than thirteen arms. Um, if we're, I, I'm not a huge fan of the way that they're necessarily handling Matthew Libertor right now. What he did when he came up and started, he was incredible. And then you put him in a situation where you, and people say, "Well, David Price did this." I understand, but I, I just would like to keep this guy and handle him as well as you can let's keep him a starter and not oh we're going to keep him as the weapon out of the bullpen but not start him because how long are you going to do that and then now you're going to ask him to go start and you're talking about a guy who maybe hasn't started in 10 games yeah i yeah i know he should be in the rotation every day and i don't even think we need to spend any time on that because that's as obvious as anything in the world he should be in the rotation the thing i do want to spend time on is Stephen matt should not be in the rotation anymore i'm over it that's that was leading to my next question and, and I have nothing against Steven Matz. He might be a great dude. I don't know him at all. But all I know is he is basically a reliever that takes the ball to start the game. He doesn't go deep into games. He's the most inefficient pitcher of all time. He's not good in the limited innings he throws for you. He doesn't do anything very well. He's become a two-pitch pitcher because he can't land his curveball. I don't know how he has a .1 war. It's not negative right now. That's wild. But he has a 5 ERA. He has a 1.6 whip. Like other, If you want to – like. 43 strikeouts and 46 innings is horrible, but put him in the fucking bullpen. I'm tired of it. Like, I am actually over it. I do not understand why Matthew Libertor is coming out of the bullpen right now at times. And Steven Matz is just given starts. Make him earn the starts, dude. Like, he's not good right now. He's really bad. And I think he could be good out of the bullpen. But, God, he's killing you. He's killing your bullpen. He's going three innings some games. You cannot have that. And they're not even a good three innings. He's laboring the entire time or he's giving up, you know, two runs or, I mean, whatever the case is, I don't, he hasn't completed six innings in over a year. Like that's not a starting pitcher. Put him in the bullpen and give him a spot start if you need it. If some guy needs a rest, you want to skip when right on a turn or whoever, for whatever reason, then you can give Steven Matz a start. But there's no reason if you're trying to win every baseball game you can to dig yourself out of this godforsaken hole you put yourself in to have Steven Matz starting anymore. He's not a good starting pitcher right now. Maybe he will be next year. Maybe he will be in three months. I don't know. But right now, he's he's hurting you more than he's helping you, and they're just blatantly ignoring it because he has a four-year contract. Yeah, that it does appear that that's what it is. That's what it like is. It sort of just, that's like, what it is. Yeah, it, it does appear that way. Um I, the Matthew Libertor thing is so mind-numbing to me because he pitched so well. Like, let's just go ahead and keep him on his regular days. And then you put him into a situation out of the bullpen, something he's not used to doing. Uh, 
and you tell them, well, be ready. Well, that's not how, like pitchers are creatures of, of habit. Like they, they are used to put me in this situation. This is my routine. And I know that it was a bullpen day. I understand all of that. A bullpen day, guys, is different than coming into a major league game to try to get out in a game that you're trying to win still. So I, I just don't understand it. Let, let's talk a little bit about Jordan Montgomery. Um, his last three starts, he's only gone a total of 14 innings and 8.15 ERA. He has not been good. He wasn't good again last night. Uh, any concern? I mean, I think there has to be a little concern with Jordan Montgomery. No. No, not really. I, he's just been so consistent in his whole career that it doesn't concern me, really. Um, it, the only thing that I will say is a lot of people, I think, got their hopes up that he was a top of the rotation starter. And that's just not who he is as a pitcher. Like, nothing against Jordan Montgomery. He's a really good middle of the rotation guy that's going to, that does knock on wood, but throughout his career, he's been really, really, really healthy. Takes the ball every day, throws around 180 innings every year, and he's just Mr. Consistent. And for some reason, I don't know what it is about this franchise that they think that they can get guys and make them more than they are. They are. Like, I guess because Dave Junkin spoiled them for so long, but it's just not the case. Like, Jordan Montgomery's a middle. Is a number three, number four. He's a number four on a really good team, probably. A number, I, I'll say number three. That's kind of disrespectful. But no, I'm not worried about him. It's just who he is. He's gonna be. He's gonna give get hit sometimes because his stuff is not elite. So it's just it's just gonna happen. I do think he's gonna be better than he's been lately. But I I also think middle rotation guys are gonna go through stretches where they get hit pretty hard. And if your location's not on, you're not, you're gonna get smoked. Like guy, I got like Spencer Strider. If his location's not on, he's probably still going to do pretty well because he's throwing 100 mile per hour BBs. That's not who Jordan Montgomery is. So he'll be fine. But I do think people had their expectations were a little out of whack because of how good he was last year and then how good he started this year. Um, just a question here, because uh, I do think it's something interesting as you brought it up. Or, I mean, I know that we're I know that we're harping on um, Stephen Matz a little bit. But would it would it shock you to know that in his last two starts he's gone ten innings and he has a two point seven ERA? Like, I mean, he's going no. five a night. I, he I went mean, four point two last start. Huh? He went four point two. He's not even eligible for a win. I'm saying average as an average. All right, as an average. No, that's bad, Dad. That's bad. I'm sorry. A two point seven ERA going, keeps you in games, Caleb. A two point seven ERA, yeah, and it also kills your bullpen because he doesn't pitch any innings. He's he's not a. If you want him to give you two or three or four innings. Put him in the damn bullpen and let him do it. But he's not helping you as a starter. He hasn't gone six innings in a year. I understand that. I completely That's understand that. That's unacceptable. That's not a starting pitcher. But here's the thing. I mean, do we, what are we expecting Wayne Oates to do? You, I mean, right now, that's the problem. Like, you I mean, have a lot of guys you games don't know. over the last year. He's had complete games. Stephen Matz doesn't even get it. Stephen Matz hasn't. You know what that means? That means Stephen Matz hasn't even given himself a chance to get a quality start in over a year. Yeah. Well, he was hurt. He, okay. he missed most of last year. He, he, like, he let's, started. Let's also throw the truth. That's not the true, though. He, he, I mean, what did he get hurt in June? It is true. What was it, June? I mean, still, like, he's he's not – I mean, he hasn't had one this year. How many starts does he have? Not one where you can go six innings. Again, like, I, I understand. I just thought I'd play the little devil's advocate there. Uh, in I the guess last that he's not games, giving up a ton of runs, but I'm sorry. You can't go four and a third. It's even worse that you're going four and a third and not giving up any runs because that means you're just throwing stupid pitches the whole game. Why is he waste so many pitches? In the last pitches? 15 games, you have three pitchers, uh, who uh, and they're all out of the bullpen, who have under a 1.9 ERA. Name them. Go. You're like, hold on. What did you just say? In the last 15 games, which is a nice little streak, that's two weeks, you have okay. three pitchers on the team who have under a 1.9 ERA. Name them. All of them are out of the bullpen. Go. Okay, Hicks? Zero. Hasn't given up a run in two weeks. Um, Stratton? Negative. Stratton has a, a 6.75 ERA. Yeah, he had a bad outing. He had a really bad outing. I forgot about Um, Not Palante. It's yes. Not Gio. 1.86. Okay. Um, Not Gio because he had that blow up yes. again. Zero. Yeah, that's your three. Over, Gallegos, wait, what, Hicks, and Palante. Over the last 15 games. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's that's pretty impressive. You know, like, wow. you know, and you need those guys. And obviously, Helsley's had, I mean, last night to lose a game like that is, I, it, it's still a rule I hate. I know a lot of people like it. I know you don't dislike it. I understand it again. I still hate it. You work your ass off for nine innings, and then now we're putting a, a, a Mickey Mouse runner on second base. But, like, was, but that's dumb to me because you have the same opportunity as anybody else. I, I, that, that means nothing. I still don't like it. 
I don't. Yeah, like they it. had a guy on second base with nobody out and didn't move him over. I don't care for the not, tenth inning and you get a lead off. I'm not arguing how. Top. I'm not arguing how the game ended. I'm arguing that I don't like the rule either way. That's all I'm yeah. saying. It is what it is. I mean, it's not Hells' fault, obviously. And he had that start against I mean, that outing against L.A. where he was really, really good in the first inning of work and kind of blew it up in the second inning. But Gio came in and saved, and they ended up winning that game. Um, I'm surprised. I mean, Gio's been really solid this year. I don't think he gets enough love for how good he's been. Like, he had that one really, really bad outing against Anaheim. But since, but other than that, like, rock yes. solid. You're talking about a 1.96 ERA, 1.0 whip. Um, 17 games pitch. He's only given up a, a few runs, four saves. Like he's been, he's been rock solid for this team. Would they really have needed him too? And he's starting to get lefties out at a better rate too, which is needed because last year it was avoid lefties at all costs because he was going to get shelled. He's been used in a variety of innings too. Like you'll see him in the seventh. You'll see him yeah. maybe in the seventh and part of the eighth. You'll see him as a closer. Like he has done everything they've asked of him. You know, it was funny years ago. We, myself included, got caught up in the when Luke Voigt was hitting tanks for New Yankees. But boy, oh boy, that is a that is a trade that the Cardinals fleeced the New York Yankees on right there by getting Giovano Giovano Giovanni Gallegos for Luke Voigt. That was he has been very good since joining the. I'm better than very good. That's not even He's good enough like, for Gio. If you were to look at the most consistent relievers since that trade and since he came up with us. He'd be top five in baseball and the most consistent relievers in that time. And it's not even close. Right. Uh, tonight, back at uh, what's the – I don't even know what the, the ballpark is called Great American anymore. Ballpark. There it is. Great American Ballpark. Um, okay. Let me just say this before we get into – and we don't have to go through the whole rest of the series. We can do whatever you'd like to do with that. On Sunday, Cardinals play the Dodgers. Day game. 43,000 people. Mm-hmm. Monday night in Cincinnati. 9,000 people. What is going on? In, I guess when you have an owner who comes out and says, you know we're probably going not going to win. Like, and horrible. you also have an owner who says, we're not going to win and we're not going to spend money. Like, Can we get Joey Votto out of Cincinnati? He's 40 years old and in the injured list. I think he's stuck. <laughs> that poor guy. That, that poor guy. But yeah, it got Graham Ashcroft tonight. Ashcraft. Ashcraft tonight for the... Ashcraft. Is that who it is? Is it Ashcraft or Ashcraft? Yes. That's what I said. I, I corrected myself. And then you I made know. me feel I was like I didn't you know what I was that. saying. Ashcraft tonight um, and against Wayno. What what do we, what are you expecting there? A win. Okay. The Reds suck. <laughs> I, we lost, but the Reds fucking suck. They're horrible at baseball. <laughs> like they're just really bad at baseball. They have Matt McLean batting second. I don't even know who the hell that is. And maybe he's been good. I don't even know. But God, he's batting second for them. Like this team is bad, and I don't care. If if there's, uh, you know, you think of the pitching advantage. I mean, Ashcraft, who we were kind of talking the other day, like, we're like, he might be pretty good. No, not really. He's got a five ERA almost. Like, he's not been very good. So here's what I expect. Go hit some homers. You're in that tiny-ass stadium and destroy them and make them feel bad about themselves because they should because they suck. So go win. Go win the next three games. You, I'll be giving you a pass. You know, you just came off a high, a really big week against two really good opponents. We've seen this before where they go into a bad team and the energy is not exactly the same, and maybe they get punched in the mouth and wake up. I think you're going to see a motivated team. I just have a hard time believing they lose two in a row to this team. I really do. The Reds are so bad. Yeah, and you know, it's just so weird to see a 540 central time game. That I, I still can't get used to that. That they're is early, Eastern and time. I know they're on Eastern time. I don't know, but still, that's still just an odd time to me. Um, Tomorrow, obviously, you have another 540 start. You've got Lively. I, is that Blake Lively? I don't know who that is. I'm telling you, this team is. Isn't that an actress, Blake Lively? Yes. I think it is. It is. <laughs> you got your boy Matt's against your boy Matt's. So there you go. And then you've got a uh, Thursday don't getaway do that. day. Like, I hate him. <laughs> I just think he should be. You got Miles, Miles versus Weaver. Is that Jeff or Luke no, that's or Luke. Jared? I know. It's Luke. I know. It was former Cardinal. You don't even let Weaver. my jokes take. Yeah, take but your form. joke was stupid because you left the one out that was actually a Cardinal. Like, that's, this guy was a Cardinal. I Cardinal's. said Luke. I said Luke. You said Jeff or. Whatever. Luke or Jared. Saying. See, you don't even listen. Either way. Um, yeah, then, we go, okay. then we go to Cleveland for Hold the on. weekend. Hold on. Let's not go to Cleveland yet. We'll get there after we'll talk about the Red Series. Let's um, win the next three games. This team is bad. Don't split a four-game series with the Cincinnati Reds. Because yeah. then, to me, in my head, you know, you take three or four in a series where you kind of expect at most to split. That's a massive win. Don't, don't like, 
negate that by now splitting against the Reds because that's kind of what you're doing because it would have been the same as just splitting against the Dodgers and winning a series you should win. So go go win the next three games, please. Like, this team is bad. They're really bad. I don't even know if I can – like, they're so bad that the owner literally said to their fans, where else are you going to go? Right. Exactly. Like, like, that's how bad they are. The well, they're not the going to the ballpark. They're not going to Great American Ballpark. No. So they are going – they must be going to Skyline Chili. I don't know what they're doing, but I know that they are – like, Johnson India is batting third for that team. So please go beat them. They're going, they're going to the Bengal spring practice. I think that's what they're doing in Cincinnati. That's what I would be doing. More yeah. Fun. Um, yeah. The, the, the match are the, honestly, I know you're on the road. I know you're playing 17 in a row, but when you look at, you know, the, the um, guardians and then you've got the Royals, like it is set up, but again, the pitching has to, has to, to step up and the offense has to continue to hit and you got to continue to drive in runs with, with the runners in scoring position, which last night we saw bases loaded then three and three strikeouts in the night that those things shouldn't happen. But let's be honest, Diaz is nasty. Oh, yeah, there's something Sorry, in that, that family, drink there. Yeah. That family is doing something with their sliders. I don't know. Like Alexis is Edwin Diaz. It's crazy. They're the same pitcher. Yeah. Like Edwin's they, a yeah. better, better, but they're like, they're the same person. It's crazy. They're both so good. Yeah. And they're, um, yeah. So it is what it is. Once again, like just go win the next three. Don't like, here should be the goal against the Reds. Alexis Diaz shouldn't pitch because you shouldn't be in the late inning situation where the game is close. Right. So don't right. let him and come you back. You know, you get lucky. You get lucky. You don't have to see Hunter Green. I know he's had his struggles with the long ball. We saw that on Sunday in New York um, and not lucky because like we don't ever want anybody hurt. You don't have to face Nick Lodolo who is one of the the good young pitch. Like Cincinnati's pitching is in a good, good spot. DJ's got him in a good spot over there with the Reds. And, you know, they, they have no other, they just don't have anybody else around them to, to do anything. But the pitching, the young pitching is there. If they can find a way to go spend some money on some hitting, Cincinnati's a team that could get right in the next few years pretty quickly. They just have to make those correct moves. They got a young, a lot of young guys also offensively. They just have to step up and take that next uh the next step um, for, I know we got a few things we want to talk about before, but I think it's, we've gone long enough that um, unfortunately you always have to bring it up, but it is important. Cardinals with another terrible loss in the Cardinal family this week, uh, Rick Hummel, the commish legend. Like I, I can't count the amount of times I listened to KMOX late at night after the game. Oh, what was it? The, the call in uh, open sports. Oh my God. Whatever sports it was called. Line. Right. There it is. I, I knew it was something like that. And and the commission was on there. I mean, you're talking about a guy who started with the Cardinals in 1973, Hall of Famer, award winner. Everyone loved the commish. Seemed like literally one of the nicest guys. Uh, once again, the Cardinals family loses one of their one of the greats. Yeah, Hall of Fame writer. Um, as someone who wants to do what commission has done his whole life, I have a ton of respect for him. He's one of the best to ever do it. And it's all it's really sad. I didn't know he was sick. I don't think many people did know. Um, no, I don't need it. It is really sad because he was just on the radio Friday. I was listening to him talk to Bernie, but it is really sad and he'll be missed. But I mean, one of the one of the legends, he's in the Baseball Writers Hall of Fame. So that's yep. about as, I mean, that just sums it up. Like, there's not many in that Hall of Fame and he's one of them. I mean, when you look at the the names, man, over the last five years, that's that's Cardinal history that you've, I mean, almost all of it, like that you've lost in the last five years, uh, hopefully so. Maybe we don't have to talk about this again, but just wanted to pay our respects to the Hummel family, to Rick is what he did, to everyone around him. So many people who watch our show and who we interact with on the daily interacted with Rick Hummel on the daily and had nothing but incredible things to say about him uh, from all accounts, post-dispatch in 73, literally one of the greatest humans probably to help to be part of the Cardinal writing, journalism, broadcasting group. Um, so that, he's going to be missed. I'm sure that there's a lot of people right now. You know, I saw the Reds did a pretty cool tribute last night for, was it him and Shannon, I think? Um, yeah. I saw it on the video board. I didn't get a chance to watch all of it, but that's pretty cool. Uh, okay, let, let's take a couple of steps around the league because there's a couple of things I want to talk about before we get out of here. Is, is Otani going to win Cy Young and a MVP? He should, um, as of right now. I, I don't know. Is McClanahan up there too? There's a lot. Framber Valdez. I mean, there's a lot of guys that could win Cy Young. Right. I don't know if he's going to win that. Um, is he, if he doesn't win MVP, it's a fucking joke. How about that? It was a joke last year too. I like they made up in a record that was a team record and gave Aaron Judge MVP because of it. 
still don't understand why that happened. Like, oh, you were not the league leader in home runs ever, but you were in Yankee history, so here's an MVP for it. I don't understand that. So I love Aaron Judge, but Otani should win MVP every single year he plays. Like, that's just – if he keeps doing this, like, he's better. He's getting better. And I don't understand – like, I almost like – it's like that fatigue. It's when LeBron wasn't winning MVPs when he was clearly the best player in the league every year. I hate that that's setting in. But Otani's going to win the MVP, and there's a chance, a pretty good chance, that he's going to be in the conversation for the Cy Young by the end of the year. By the end of the year. Well, what LeBron with with did start with Jordan. They did the same thing to him forever. Yeah. So it's the same kind of same kind of idea. Um, it, it, today I saw I got into a pretty fun discussion with some friends on on uh, social media about the. I guess SI put out an article, which take that with a grain of salt. Sports Illustrated for me as a kid waited by the door for that to come weekly so I could read it like that. It was that in Baseball Digest. Waited for that, could read it. Then on Saturdays, I watched Mel Allen on This Week in Baseball. That's where I got all my stuff was a young kid. But now Sports Illustrated kind of become the rolling stone of sports. However, they put out a thing that says Otani, one of the likely destination spots is the, the Cardinals. It, it's just interesting to me to even hear this, to, to us talk about it. And hold on, let me just finish what I was going to say. I know. But uh, here's the, the two things, and you know I've talked about it before. One, I don't know. I, from a PR move, how do you trade Otani if you're the Angels? But not. even then, how does a team acquire him? Like, if, if you want to talk about the car, let's just say, let's hypothetical world, because I'm not getting dragged into this. I'm not going to get caught up in the Otani to the Cardinals saying I'm not going to do it. I'm simply saying, does that deal have to start with Walker, Wynn, Hentz? Go, I, what, what, I don't even know what the starting point is if you're the Angels, because no matter who it is you get, you're dealing maybe the greatest player of all time. Like, that we've seen. If, not, if, maybe, if, not maybe. Not maybe. Okay. Okay. All right. I mean, a one of one, a unicorn, right? You're He's dealing that guy. You're never going to get value for that. You're never going to get those Jersey sales back. You're never going to get those tickets back. You're never going to get that international market back. Like if I'm I, Artie Moreno has had some terrible deals with, with his deals. All of them. I, I hand, I hand Otani a blank check. I say, what, do, what does it take? And what kind of ownership do you need in this franchise when you retire the day you retire that because otherwise what what it's going to do to that franchise? I can't even. I can't. My head. You're can't asking around. a lot of. You're asking a lot of different questions. Well, you know that's what's going to happen. But, but yeah, no. Artie Moreno is one of the worst owners in sports history, in my opinion. He's god awful at what he does. But um, yeah, I just I the, you, the trade's not going to happen. It's not for anybody because who do you trade? Like the teams that would be interested in getting Otani. Like let's just go through them. It's a short list, probably. Now, well, there might be a lot of people, but I think the ones that would actually like be willing to give up the prospect capital to get him, I think the Mets would. I think the Cardinals probably would be interested after what we saw with Soto last year. Um, I think the Dodgers would, but you got all these teams like the Dodgers don't trade top prospects very often. They only the the only time they traded really big prospects was for um, Trey Turner and Max Scherzer. Max Scherzer a one yeah. in a lifetime. Type and Mookie Betts. And Mookie Betts. They traded Alex Verdugo. Right, right. That's it. And Jeter Downs, who got DFA'd. Um, yeah. Like, the Mets aren't trading Francisco Alvarez. That's not going to happen. They've talked for a while since they got since Cohen went there about wanting to replenish their farm system so they don't have to get, you know, Martes and Cannons every year. And then um, the Cardinals aren't – obviously aren't going to trade Jordan Walker. So I think if you're the if you're the Angels, you're not only trading Otani for the, next, the rest of the year, you're pissing off Mike Trout, and – you're trading away any opportunity ever of Otani coming back. Because once he walks out the door, he's not coming back. So it's almost like it's impossible for any team to give you what that's worth to you. Like Agreed. the only teams that I think could really legitimately do it would be the Cardinals and maybe the Guardians, if the Guardians were in that position, just because I think they have so much young talent on their team and so much in their farm system that they could withstand whatever that would take. But the Cardinals aren't trading Mason Wynn for Otani. They'd be stupid. Unless you know for a fact you can resign him, which you could never know because Otani would be an idiot not to go to free agency and get every bit he can. So it's just ideal. I don't think it's one that would be a lot of fun. And I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of talk about it coming um, come the deadline. But I would much prefer the Angels to be in a spot where they're trying to buy people to try and win with those two. Right. Like I, I don't agree. want Otani to be traded. Honestly, I'd love to have him for half a year. But also, like, what happens if you're that team? And you're, like, it's not like Kevin Durant in those in the Suns where they have for three years. You're trading away a probably a substantial amount of your future for one run of the pennant. 
no way am I doing that. That's no. too much of a crapshoot. No, and like I said, the if you're the Angels, you can never get the value back, let alone the mon- the money that he brings your franchise outside of the game. Like yeah. it, it's just it's impossible. Like you know, Seattle's talked about Ichiro and and what he meant, not just on the field, but globally off the field for the Mariners franchise. It was a game changer. Like a lot of people didn't know Seattle probably had a baseball team till Ichiro went there. And you know that uh, you yeah. just can't do it. I, I don't I also see it think happening. Like, I don't. I don't see a return. I think one of the things that proves my my belief is that, that Otani is by far the best player in baseball history. And I think it's and maybe he ends up not having the longevity and the counting staff. That's definitely possible. But I think no matter what, you're gonna look at this three year sample size of uh, from 21 to now and say those were the best three years a baseball player has ever had on this planet. So that's where I'm at with him. But I think it's also like. It, I've never seen a player where I'm like, I don't know what you would trade for him. Like Mike Trout's one of the greatest players ever lived, but I yes. can think of a package that would get Mike Trout to St. Louis if the Angels wanted to trade him. Otani, I just can't think of it. No. Like you're just gonna have to pay yes. him like in the offseason because it's just impossible. Because if I'm Artie Moreno and I'm I don't know who their GM is over there, but if I'm them and I'm trying to get someone to trade um trade for Otani, I I'm starting with Jordan Walker from the Cardinals and I'm not coming off of it. Because why would I? If I'm the cause, I'm saying, yeah, that's funny. No, I like that. It's not happening. So I just don't think it's going to happen unless you get a team like the Dodgers that doesn't love their top prospects, maybe for whatever reason, and thinks that they they obviously have the capability to sign Otani back. And they think when they get Otani in the door, they're going to be able to keep him. I'm convinced that he wants to stay and the pay him in the offseason. I could see that happening. But even then, like the Dodgers gen- genuinely, generally, sorry don't make those massive of deals in the, in the trade, at the trade deadline, most of their big moves happen in the off season. So I just don't see it happening. You me neither. Um, Harry Manassian, Manassian, maybe it's a G. Yeah. Okay. Harry there it Manassian. is. There it is. Yeah. Want to make sure I pronounce his name. Correct. Um, was I against? Oh, okay. Well, since we're, since we're in on the, the trade talks, a lot of everybody really this this the guardians are really heating up with the cardinal twitter right now ha! saw the roll of the eyes there kale has been a little knee deep with the guardians fans on twitter today so let's go ahead and get it out there look shane bieber would i want him yes the answer i would want him am i giving up a lot to get shane bieber no uh when you look at the regression of his peripherals since the sticky tack stuff and the spin rate droppage and the velo drop he's barely striking out 0.6 guys, 0.7 guys per nine. Like that's well, seven per nine. You know what I'm saying there? Six to yeah. Right. He's striking out half a person every nine innings. <laughs> I'm not a mathematist. That'd be so, really bad. You know, that'd be really bad. You know I what I'm saying there? Like that's right. Per inning is what I meant there, but you know what I'm saying? Uh, would I like him? Would he be a, a, an upgrade for the Cardinals? Absolutely. ERA is still good. Yeah. Uh, his FIP is not good. His FIP is a four. So he is getting some luck going on with that I worry about his regression you do get a year you would get a year and a quarter with with Shane Bieber but this talk from the Guardians fans and I get it they have to ask whatever you're not getting Jordan Walker you're not getting Mason Wynn and you're not getting Nolan Gorman you're probably not getting Tink Hentz and you're not getting Graceffo maybe I I mean let's just be realistic here I mean Graceffo would I, I, I want to trade for Zeffo, but and you're not getting Lars Newbar. Like, what the hell is going on? No, no I don't even want to be as I don't even want to be as like nice as you just were. You think you're getting our one and three hitter? Are you stupid? <laughs> who who does that? Yeah, go to the Dodgers and go get go get um Freddie Freeman and Mookie Betts too. I'm sure that's gonna happen. Like Lars right. Newbar's batting first every day, and Nolan Gorman's batting third, and you think you're gonna trade a three ERA pitcher who's showing signs of regression for three years for him? A guy that's gonna get traded, and whoever pays him is gonna overpay because of name value. You're like they're like fantasy owners. Like no, I like I I I, lo- I like Shane Bieber as a as a as a pitcher. I think he's really good. I think he has a lot of good baseball ahead of him. I'm not saying he's gonna end up being an average pitcher because I don't believe that. Is I do I no, think he's an ace? No. And what do the Cardinals need? We've talked about this. They need strikeouts in their rotation. So why are we gonna go get a guy and overpay for him? Um, that doesn't strike anybody out. Like I would love Shane Bieber and I would trade for him if the price was reasonable. The problem is I just don't know how you make that trade because you're trading for a side former side young winner that's also had signs of being really good in the past, but also he's on a downturn, but he's not old enough to really be on a downturn. So what is the value there? It's almost like I don't know how you make that trade. I let someone else do it. 
And if it ends up well, go, going well for them, great. If it doesn't, great. Like, the guy, I, if I'm the Cardinals, if I'm making an upgrade and I'm trading anyone big, and by anyone big, I, Gorman, Newpar, and Walker, those three aren't going anywhere. You're, there's, like, very – like, Alcantara is the guy I would want for them. Like, other than that, you're not touching them. But if I'm trading a big I mean, prospect, like, it's going to be a guy that I genuinely believe is a lock to be my ace for the next couple of years. And I don't think Shea Bieber is that right now. No, and you look you look at a guy who in 2020, obviously that was the, the COVID year, but had, awesome. you know, 14.2 strikeouts per nine. Then it, it dropped to 12.5 to 8.9 to 6.6. Guys, why did it drop? I mean, it doesn't take, like, all you got to do is connect the dots to when we eliminated the sticky tack to when the spin rate dropped. Uh, that's part of it. I'm not saying there's it's all multiple of it. reasons, but yeah, right. But, but that yeah. is part of it. I don't want to like put that out on him because we don't know that for a fact, though. Okay. I mean, I mean, it could be, it could be, but I just, I mean, we don't know for a fact that he was cheating. So okay, so let can we just argue if it's not, then there's maybe something. Then, well, he had injuries in there as there. well. He had right. injuries so, during that time as well. So it could be a combination of both of those things. He has been linked to sticky tech, so that is something you have to talk about. Sticky tech. With spider tech and he has been linked and he also has some injuries in there so yeah i mean both those could be factors i don't know what the reasoning is i know that i don't want to get involved in in that for you know three of the best young hitters you've developed in 20 years like i i'm good i'm good on that I'll, i'll keep my young stars and i'll take my chance with with my pitching if i have to but yeah i mean i get it though like if you're a guardians fan you want to get the most you can that makes sense but for me, it just doesn't make any sense. Like, why would you think you'd get a top prospect? I'm like, no way. If you if the Guardians could get a Jordan Walker type prospect, you think Shane Bieber would still be there? Hell no. Right. He'd be gone. Right. Um, one one more name that I know is gonna maybe get you pretty fired up and get you excited before we get out of here is 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 it Dylan Cease or Bust if you're the Cardinals? Uh, I mean, but it, you can't say it like that. So I don't even like phrasing the question like that because that then means we're going to give up whatever we have to to get him but is that really maybe the guy that if you're the cardinals and and you're still right where you need to be probably hopefully leading the division come um, it's wild that we're even talking about that now after the start but where you and i were two weeks ago mentally to where we are now it's a it's a baseball's a wild ride man it's a wild ride but it's dylan c i mean if you look around the league let's just i'm gonna go with the stream of consciousness again if you look okay, well, around the league shorter this time. you're not going to see a lot of team you're not going to find a lot of aces that are probably going to be i mean we love to you use the term aces let's talk elite pitcher right i know cease has been down a little bit this year whatever um there just aren't a lot of them out there if you look at teams who are going to be sellers uh the white Sox is, are one of those teams who are probably going to be sellers that that leads you to dylan cease lucas giolito and lance lynn those are your three who they're probably going to move maybe two of those guys Maybe all three. Uh, I think give me Giolito, your thoughts on that. See, I think Giolito's gone. Like, he's going to get traded for sure. Um, he's been really good, by the way. Lucas Giolito, good for – I'm happy for him. I really like him as a person. Same. And um, he had really struggled the last couple of years. I'm glad he's getting his stock back up in his free – in his walk here. Then that makes me happy. I hope he continues that. But here – I'm going to be a little bit of a hypocrite, okay, maybe because of our C- – I mean, our Bieber thing we just had. One thing that makes me excited more than anything is that he's having a down year, Dylan C's, because – one, I think you might get the White Sox panicking and saying, was that the best year he's ever going to have last year? And we're going to need to get the most we can. Our window's closing. TA is about to leave. The Braves are already gone. Like that, when that, I think that team's going to get blown up because it should. Are they going to panic and say, oh no, like we got at least his value is still high because people think he can still be that guy. So we're going to have to get what we can get for him right now. I think that's a possibility for him. Hopefully he starts to have some better starts. But I also, I believe in Dylan Cease's stuff. I think he's just nasty. I really do. I think him in St. Louis is behind in front of our defense would be a match made in heaven for him because he strikes out so many people and they're going to save a lot of hits for him. Um, yes, if Dylan Cease is available, I'm not going to say I go all in because I don't think I'd go all in for anybody in baseball specifically. Like in basketball, would I go all in if I was a Suns for Durant? Yeah, I would go all in for Durant. Uh, but in baseball, it's just not the same. Like, So I don't think I'd go all in for him. But would I be as active in that market as any team in baseball? Yeah, I would. And I think you'd have to be. And I think also he's going to be pretty cheap. Like, that's a deal the Cardinals almost would. It would be crazy if they were not heavily involved in that deal. Like, almost like gaslighting the fan base and themselves. If they weren't in on Dylan Seeds, if he were available. He's still got two years left. You've got to pay a hefty price. But, man, 
I'll tell you what, a lot of the things that the White Sox need moving forward, some middle infield help, some outfielders, um, some young guys that are all cost controlled. I'm not t- it lines up really well for the Cardinals to be able to find some way to make a deal happen there. I don't know what it would yeah, be. Can... I don't know who they'd want, but it does line up where like you almost can't find a better match of teams, I don't think. Um, obviously, I mean, things are going to change between now and July 15th, right? We know that. There's no doubt about that. The standings are going to change. Some teams are going to get hot. Some teams are going to get cold. Some teams are just going to completely fall out of it. But if you do just kind of take it, it is interesting because I like to do this, to take a look around the league. I mean, right now, if you look in the NL East, you've got five teams who are all above 500. Now, is Boston Fugazi? I don't know. Maybe. Is Chris Sale a guy who's going to be up there to get traded? Potentially. I don't know that answer. But you look at the Central – Kansas City's rebuilding. They don't have anybody. They're going to deal Chapman. I would assume that they're going to deal him. But, I mean, Cleveland, Bieber is, is, is a guy who's probably going to get dealt. I don't know about Cal Quantrill. That's not a guy the Cardinals need to be interested in. They got five other Cal Quantrills on their team. Uh, the White Sox is, is, a, is interesting, obviously. Oakland doesn't have anybody that you're going to want. They got rid of – they've already traded everyone. If oh, you look in the NL them. East – even though Philly's struggling, they're never going to probably be sellers, even though you got Aaron Nola. If they, get, if they get really bad, they might. But that, that's get really bad for that to happen. It would have to get really, really bad. It would have I mean, to be like no question they can't dig out of it. And I don't think they're going to get to that and, point. And I think I, I think you can say the same thing about San Diego. Like it would have to get that bad yeah, for they're them. Not trade. They won't do that. Right. Anyway. That's what I'm saying. So if you look around the league, it's really the Guardians, who I still think aren't out of it, by the way. That team could get hot. There's no doubt about it. Because it's not like the Twins are going to run away with that division, I don't think. Um, I, no. I don't know. I don't know. Detroit's right there in the middle of it. Good for them. They're playing good baseball. I don't know how long that lasts. But, again, they don't necessarily have anybody that you would be – they'll be screaming to, to knock down the door for. That's the thing that's, like, so interesting is you can really narrow down the targets this year, I think. But also yeah. that's scary because that means that everyone else is doing the same thing. So it's going to right. be a bidding war for whoever you want. And it's a really bad time to be in that spot because – one pitching is a premium every year, so there's going to be nearly every big team, but the Cardinals, for whatever reason, goes after elite pitching at the deadline because you can always use it, and it's really going to have to take like Miami wanting to deal Edward Cabrera, and maybe he's really really good, or Jesus Lazardo, and wanting to do something like that because Max Meyer is going to be back next year, whatever they want to do. But I don't know. I don't know who's going to be available. I didn't know Jordan Montgomery was going to be available, and we got him. I didn't right, know Jose right. Quintana like said, was going to be great for things us. Things are going to change. We, yeah. Yeah, so we'll see. It's going to be interesting, though. Like, we still got two over two months until this happens, and a lot of teams can lose a lot of games or win a lot of games before then. We'll see. I know I know there are a lot of uh, a lot of fans who are wanting there to be a deal made sooner or later. That just doesn't happen very often. No. Not for a guy of uh, Dylan Cease. For, for and, two and also, reasons. White Sox get – hold on. White Sox get hot. Mm-hmm. Like, maybe they – I mean, this again, the Central's winnable. Like, let's be honest. I'm not saying they're yeah, going to do it. Hot, I'm though. just saying the Central's winnable. But, two, the longer you wait if you're the White Sox, the more value you're going to get yeah. for the assets you have. And that goes for every team. So very rarely are you going to see, I mean, there have been trades early on before we've seen them. Uh, the Willie Adamas trade was early. Like we've seen that stuff happen. I just don't think you're going to see a lot of those deals involving top of the rotation, starting pitching, getting dealt this year before, before the trade deadline. Also, it'd be dumb with the Cardinals to do that because you look at it and look at the guys that the Cardinals have in their lineup right now that we didn't know we're going to be contributors. Like I'm not Mercado's not playing every day. He's playing against lefties mostly, but it, there's like, there's just, you don't know what you're going to need even in a month from now. So to go make a trade like that one, the only time it happens is if it really benefits both teams, like that trade that year, um, the Rays got JP fire eyes and another reliever. And those guys were lights out for them when they got them. So yes. it been, it was rare with it. It benefits both teams like that. And also Willie Adamas at the time, was not the power hitting, um, you know, shortstop that he is now. So he kind of became that in Milwaukee. So they also had wasn't Wonder like, Franco knocking down the door. Yeah, and Willie Adams wasn't going to be a guy that fetched you a massive return at the deadline. It wasn't going to yeah. happen. So it has to be a perfect storm, and it's just not that for the Cardinals right now. And also, like they're playing fine baseball, so they don't really need to do that right now. So if I were to tell you at the beginning of the year, um, before we get out of here, that the top two teams in Major League Baseball on May twenty third would be in the AL East, right? Yeah. Would you have guessed the Rays and the Orioles? I probably would have guessed the Rays and the Blue Jays. Well, I think a lot of people would have guessed the Yankees and the Blue Jays, to be honest with I you. I just I, – I, I'm a Yankee hater. I think they – I know you, 
You're also a disbeliever, which honestly has proven to be good for you. But no, that's saying, what I meant. I don't hate yeah. them as a team, but God, they suck. And I don't know it, why they win games even almost. No, nobody goes to games in Tampa, but man, they're fun to watch. They're Everyone, trying to go to more of them. They are. Everyone's going to games in Baltimore. And guys, yeah. if you're not watching awesome. them, you should be because that team is electric. They are an electric factory every night. Um, they nobody, I don't think anybody took more gruff. Is that the right word I'm looking for? Um, grief, gruff, whatever, in the offseason for not going out and spending a lot of money than the Baltimore yeah. Orioles, a team that was this close to making the playoffs last year when nobody thought they would be. Right now, that is paid off in spades. Like, to be really honest, because what they've done is they're still aligned to make deals at the trade deadline. I mean, they weren't, the, the Orioles have never been an organization sans the Chris Davis terrible deal who are going to go out and, and spend on the Justin Verlanders or the Jacob de Grams and prop. I mean, smartly, by the way, let's look at what those two have done. We don't know how it's going to end, but the Orioles have set themselves up nicely. That bullpen is incredible. What Adley Rushman, I don't, I I'm, I'm prepared to say he's the best catcher in baseball. I will say it right now yeah. and I will stick to it. When you had the defense, the offense and the clutchness, he's the best player in baseball. No, his team. He's not the best player in baseball. He's the best sorry, catcher. catcher. Baseball. Sorry, catcher. Um, his teammates love him, man. I, I love that guy. Yeah, he's great. Um, and the Orioles are good for them. I'm not going to give them a pass for being cheap because they should have gotten somebody because that rotation is still not very good. I don't care if they're performing well. Like you need, if you want to, if you want to go like the right now, like they're they're no longer the cute Orioles story. They're a team now that's trying to win and win now, and it's coming fast because their youth is developing faster than anybody could have imagined. And I think Grayson Rodriguez is going to be a really good pitcher for them. But man, like they they should be in on Dylan Cease. Like if that right. if that does become available, but they should be in on people like that. So I'm really happy for them. Uh, we haven't can't talk about the Orioles without talking about Jackson Holiday. That guy's going to be the top prospect in baseball come the opening day next year. I guarantee it. He is a stud. He's like already been promoted. He's it. He's he's awesome. Like he's gonna he's gonna be a guy that's making a debut at 20 years old. Like that's who he's gonna be. He's a he's a stud. Shocker. I mean, he's Matt Holiday's kid, so who's the price? But. Um, I'm happy for the Orioles fans because that's a really fun fan base when they're good. Like that that stadium yes. gets really excited. That city really loves the Orioles. They were just so bad for so long that it was impossible to root for them. But I'm really glad. Adley, I had said this on Twitter earlier. I don't I think I've ever seen a player in baseball turn around a franchise as quickly as Adley Rushman did. Like maybe Griffey, but even then I don't know if he did it that quickly. Like the way that Adley Rushman turned around the Orioles instantly – I've never seen that in baseball before, I don't think. Griffey's a good comparison. There's probably somebody else out there. Um, I mean, what Bryce Harper did in Washington, that, I mean, that was pretty, you know, that that was pretty successful. Yeah. Um, but yeah, 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 yeah. I, I'm not, I, I agree with you. I, and I'm, we're just massive fans. We were fans of him when he was at Oregon State. I continue to be a massive fan of his. I love everything about his game. And the guy just works his ass off and just gets better every day. Uh, sort of like Nolan Gorman here. You guys, everybody who watches this show knows that Jared Kellenick's my other dude. That guy is having an incredible year because that's all he's he raking. does. That, that's all he does out in Seattle. And, and it took him a little bit to find it. He's found it. Um, baseball's in a great I'll, spot right now. Do you see the revenues were up and the the, pe- yeah. the people are going to the games? The, uh, baseball's in a really good spot. And with streaming yeah. taking over the world, the amount of money that's going to come into Major League Baseball over the next five to ten years is going to be silly money. Yeah. Um, well, a couple more things I have to say, and then we can go and get out of here. We're going pretty long right now. But, yeah, we need to get um, – Jared Kelnick, what if he becomes like better than J Rod? How crazy I'm here for would that be? It. That'd be a crazy development because I would me clowning you for so long would make me look stupid. But also, um, I have what, what was the other thing I had to say? Oh, yeah, baseball had the highest attendance ever in a weekend in May last weekend. So that's awesome. Yep. Um, that, that's great for baseball. So keep doing, keep going to games, man. If your team is winning, unless you're like an athletics fan, then don't go because why would you? Um, but if you're a fan of almost any other team, Go, go support them because they're pretty fun. A lot of bad teams are outperforming what I expected this year, which I like. So yeah, it's continues. good for baseball. And again, it's May it's May twenty third. We understand that, but so no, far, course, so no, good. it's not early anymore though. No, it's, it's we're we're, into the over, we're past the quarter mark of the season. Almost so. two months in. Yep. Um, okay. Well, you got the Reds for the next three. We'll be back uh, right before the Guardian series, so we'll be back and and have that done. Hopefully, we're talking about a three out of four. Got to win the next. The next we will be got a split, but let's go ahead and let's go ahead and you take wanna, the three. You want to give our prediction for the series and a player really quickly and then get out of here. Yeah. Okay. Quickly go. Okay. I'm going, I think Goldie's going to get really high um, today. 
and go off the next couple of days. It's really well in that stadium, and I think they're going to win off three because, like I said, the Reds aren't barely a major league baseball team. Okay, I'm concerned that we win too because I just have a feeling I've seen too many fluky games in Cincinnati yeah. in my lifetime. That's my concern. We win two of the next three. It sucks to split, but it, it's better than losing three out of four. It is what it is. Like, you can I survive think, that. I think it's Nolan Gorman. I think it's Nolan Gorman's <laughs> world, and we're just living in it. Maybe. I mean, it is. It seems to be. It seems to be that so, way. So, uh, once again, guys, thank you so much for joining us. We greatly appreciate you. You can find all of our social medias here and in the bio and everywhere else. Hit that little subscribe button. Uh, we'd love for you to tell a friend. Come join us. Uh, Cardinals are rolling. Cardinals, when do they come home? Next week, maybe? Next week to St. Louis? Yeah. All right. Yeah, get out and see some live, get some some baseball when they get back. We'll talk to you before that. Uh, appreciate you. Have a great day. Go Cards.